Hey, good morning, everyone. Love it that you're joining us this morning for the final part of our series called Debate Club. I hope that you're well and that you've had a good week. In fact, let's find out. If you're able to, why not drop into the chat just a number between one and 10 that represents your week. You know, if it's been a bad week, make it a low score. You know, one out of 10 equals the worst week you've ever had. Reading all the way up to the best week, scoring 10 out of 10. Go on, let us know how you score this past week for yourself. You know, my week has actually been a good one. I could score it nine out of 10. I've had a couple of days off work to go to Bristol to see my daughter, Rachel, and for the two of us to see Elton John in concert. It's supposedly his final tour, so I was so excited to be there and just sing along with all the classics. In fact, here's another question for you. What's your favourite Elton John song? You know, is it your song, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, uh, Rocket Man, Circle of Life, Sacrifice, I'm Still Standing, Crocodile Rock. Honestly, the list just seems to be endless. But go on, let us know in the chat what your favourite Elton John song is. Now, this week, Mike Walsh is concluding our series about the power of our words. It's called Debate Club. And let's get a sneak preview of what Mike's talking about today. Hi, everyone. We're in the third part of our Debate Club series. And today we're in for a real treat. We're going to find out how we can win. How do we win arguments, disagreements, and at the same time, make a difference? It's going to be great. It's going to be learning something that I think everybody will be interested in. We all want to win, don't we? Um, And so join me a little bit later. Well, I'm really looking forward to that. So let's crack on with the service. Why not quickly grab a drink and be ready for the start in just a minute or two? I'm going to see you soon. Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome to Forge Church and welcome to our online service today. Love it that you're joining us today. Uh, And if you've just tuned in and you haven't come across the Forge before, I just want to give a very special welcome to you. You know, we're a church community that wants to help people find and follow Jesus. Why? Well, it's because our experience is that following Jesus makes life better and makes us better at life. My name is Steve and it's my job to lead us through the service today. And in a moment, I'm going to be handing over to the band to lead us in some songs. Then Mike Walsh is going to conclude our series with some, well, I think some of the best advice ever when it comes to our words and how we can create a win in our conversations with others. And it's not just about winning an argument. But before that, hey, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this new day. Thank you uh, for all the good things that you give to us. Please, would you help us encounter you today? And would you teach us how to use our words wisely? In Jesus' name, amen. Why did I wait so much time? 
Promise.
Hey everyone, my name's Mike and I'm a volunteer here at The Forge and I'm really excited about the topic we're looking at today. We're in the last part of our debate club series where a couple of weeks ago Pete brought to us thoughts around when and how we should speak up. Then last week, if you caught up online, we had a talk by Andy Stanley continuing the series with how we need to control our tongue. And today, I'll give you the secret behind how we can win. How we can win arguments, conflicts, debates, disagreements. And not just win, but also make a difference. I'm sure that's prompted a keener level of interest now I've revealed that, particularly if you happen to be parents to teenagers like me. But before I share with you the secret of how to win, about 10 years ago, I was Christmas shopping with my youngest daughter, Mia, who was just three, year, three years old at the time. This was what she looked like at the time. We were shopping for presents for my wife, Claire. Now, Claire is great. She doesn't just give me a list of ideas. Instead, she sends me pictures of the actual things she wants and the specific shops to get them from. Not sure if she doesn't trust my taste or if she just knows I hate shopping. So we're walking into Accessorise in Bury St Edmunds. And for some inexplicable reason that I still to this day do not know why I did this. But I said to Mia, so we need to get mummy some slippers. Which ones do you think she will like? I... Don't know why I asked this because I knew exactly which ones she wanted because I had a picture of them on my phone. Just to provide some context, at the age of three, Mia was, to be honest, the most stubborn human being I'd ever met in my 30 odd years on this planet. She's grown out of a bit of it now, but back then she once made her mind up, there was no changing it. So despite knowing the exact slippers Claire wanted, I'd asked my three-year-old daughter which slippers would mummy like. Needless to say, Claire definitely didn't want the sparkly unicorn ones that Mia was now holding. I tried to politely suggest that Mummy probably wouldn't like those ones. No, Daddy, I think she would. Well, Mia, I don't think she will. I think she'd like these ones instead. No, Daddy, Mummy likes unicorns. 
No, Mia, seriously, I know Mummy would like these ones. I'd like to say this ended really amicably there and then, but it didn't. We stood for what felt like ages, arguing about which slippers Mummy would like, until, in my peripheral vision, I spotted three or four ladies who were now standing watching a 33-year-old man having an argument with his three-year-old daughter over a pair of unicorn slippers. So panicking, I snatched the slippers from Mia, put them back on the shelf and said, No, Mia, Mummy wants these ones. We have to get her a diary in the next shop. You can choose that. And I stormed off to pay. So we walked round the corner to Paper Chase, full transparency. We weren't holding hands because Mia had her arms tightly crossed. Again, I don't know why I've said she can choose the diary, as I have a picture of the one Claire wants on my phone. So I'm thinking I need to get ahead of the curve here. I spot the diary and enthusiastically try to convince Mia this is the one to choose. She's having none of it. Grabs another one, snatches the diary out of my hand, puts it back on the shelf and says to me, No, Daddy, you chose the slippers, I'm choosing the diary, and stormed off to the till to wait for me to pay. Full transparency, for the rest of the shopping trip, we didn't hold hands because I had my arms tightly crossed. As you can see, winning arguments well is not necessarily my area of expertise. So what is the secret of how to win in moments of disagreement or argument? Well, before I reveal that, I think we need to think about what winning looks like. You see, when we're in a conflict, a disagreement, an argument, basically both sides want the same thing. We want to be heard and we want to be understood. And even further than that, we want to be right. We know we're right. We want the other person to know we are right. And if we're honest, we want everyone else to know that we're right. And the problem with that approach is that in these situations, it can either mean we go on the ver verbal offensive or perhaps say things we don't actually intend, or we're on the receiving end and end up being hurt by the other person's words or actions. And in this situation, we can win the argument but lose relationally. We can win the fight in being right but lose the relationship. Andy Stanley would say we can right the person right out the door. So what does it really need to look like to win in these moments? Well, I think it's this, and this is the bottom line right here. Don't settle for being right. Try to make things right instead. Let me repeat that. Don't settle for being right. Make things right instead. This is what winning looks like, and if we can achieve it, it can make a real difference in our relationships, at home, at work, and among our friends. Sounds great, but how can we do this? It's really quite simple and can be demonstrated in just a few words. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Repeat after me. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And before you start high-fiving me and saying, that's a great idea, Mike, it's not my idea. You see, there's a guy called James in the Bible. He's Jesus' brother. And he wrote what we now know as the book of James in the New Testament part of the Bible. James doesn't really come into prominence in the Bible until after Jesus dies. Now, I guess that's understandable because when your brother is alive and claiming he's the son of God, it probably gets on your nerves. But when that brother is crucified, then resurrected, and then appears to a bunch of people and finally ascends to heaven, well, perhaps that changes your perspective. So after this, James is all in. He becomes a really prominent leader in the early church. In fact, he leads the church in Jerusalem and writes a bunch of really wise advice to teach the early church that is still relevant to us today as to what it looks like to follow Jesus and live a life reflecting that. And right in the first chapter of his book, he writes these words. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. He's talking to everyone. And what should we all do first before anything else? Everyone should be quick to listen. Quick hastily, straight away, before thinking of anything else, before doing anything else, listen. I like to read a lot of leadership business types books and there's a classic one called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And the fifth habit is this, seek to understand, then be understood. Before you do anything else, seek to understand, listen, understand the other person, the situation, the context. In the first week, Pete spoke to us about three principles when speaking up, and the first of those was listen to understand, not to respond. Really try to understand the other person, not just to reply, but understand. Stephen Covey's son, also called Stephen, wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. And Stephen Jr. distills this even further. He says, listen first. Don't even think about anything else, 
but listen first. And he goes further than that, saying, don't just listen with your ears, listen with your eyes as well, and even more, listen with your heart. You see, communication is more than just the words we say. It's said that just 7% of our understanding in communication comes from the words we actually say. 38% comes from how we say the words, and 55% comes from our body language. So we should listen with our ears, with our eyes, and with our hearts. And he went on to say we should listen for as well as listen to. Listen for as well as listen to. We should listen for what matters. Listen for what is behind what is being said. Listen for the heart of the other person. Listen for the context, not just listen to the words. Claire, my, li- my wife, will be laughing at me talking and about listening and actively listening. I'm the worst at not even looking up when being spoken to, occasionally nodding or grunting some sort of acknowledgement that I am listening. I know how frustrating that is when others do it to me, yet I still carry on. But the more actively we listen, the more we understand and the more we learn. James goes on and says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. This is almost an underlining of the importance of listening. To wait, to pause, don't speak, don't speak yet, resist the urge. This is really difficult as a parent to teenagers. We're desperate to heap a whole load of wisdom and experience onto our kids. We know best, yet stop talking because I'm about to shower you with telling you what you should be thinking, doing and saying. But we're to be slow to speak. And when we do speak, we need to continue trying to understand. So we need to be curious, to ask questions. The kind of, I don't quite see it your way, could you explain it differently? It's really difficult, but so worth it. And James continues, quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. Perhaps this is because if we stay calm, we'll do a better job of convincing the other person I'm right. No, it's not that. Remember, we can write people right out of the door. This is not about being right. It's about trying to make things right instead. And anger is unhealthy because it escalates. It becomes uncontrollable. In the next verse, James goes on. He says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Righteousness, well, that just means what is deemed right by God. And basically our human anger, our misinformed wrath, does not produce that which is right by God. Our right is not the right right. I won the argument, but I don't know where they've gone. Uh, We want to be right. They want to be right. We both can't be right, but we can be right with one another. We say hurtful things. We hear hurtful things and we lose. You know, in disagreements, everything we believe and say makes perfect sense to us. And the things the other person believes and says can seem crazy to us. But we need to listen, learn and understand and be slow to speak and therefore slow to anger. So how do we do this? Well, James goes on. He says, therefore, get rid of all of the moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Get rid of all the moral filth, take it off, wash the filth off, get rid of the I'm right bucket, the wisdom, experience, I'm right bucket, chuck it away and then humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. This is really interesting language. This is to the early church. Jesus has ascended to heaven and the Holy Spirit is now dwelling within those Christians, God's word planted in you. And James brings it back to humility. And who demonstrates humility above all others? Jesus. He put others ahead of himself and in the moment of disagreement when everything within us wants to be right, the thing we need to do is take that off, put it to one side and humbly accept the word planted in us, which can save us, save our relationships, our jobs, our relationships with our children. And Jesus taught us how to do this when he gave his one commandment. He said this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus came to reconcile us to God and to one another. As Jesus put us ahead of himself, we should then put others ahead of ourselves to not look to be right, but to make things right. I want to get really practical now with just a couple of things to think about and put into action. Coming back to the very heart of this, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, to seek to understand, then be understood, to listen first, to listen for, not just to. I want you to think right now, back to the last week, or if you're a real angel, then the last fortnight. Is there a time you didn't listen first? An example where you weren't quick to listen, when you didn't seek to understand? 
and perhaps you were quick to speak, quick to judge, quick to lose your temper. What was the result of that? And what could have been different? And secondly, as we look forward, I want us to be intentional and conscious about the next time we find ourselves in a situation, perhaps in this coming week. When that occurs, and it most likely will, just stop and ask yourself, am I seeking to understand or respond? Do I really understand how they feel and where they are coming from? Remember, we need to listen with our ears, our eyes and our hearts. We need to listen for, not just to. We need to focus on not settling on being right, but making things right instead. Jesus was sent to reconcile us to God and to one another, to make things right, not to be right. He commanded us to model that too, to love one another, to put others first. So let's be quick to listen, slow to speak, and let's focus on making things right, not being right.
I'm so grateful that you've chosen to join us this morning at The Forge. I hope that you found it helpful and that what Mike shared will actually make a difference to us going forward. You know, let's not be right at each other, but be right with each other. Hey, and if you would value prayer or support off the back of today's service, just put the prayer hands emoji in the chat and one of our team will be in touch with you. Uh, otherwise, you can just email us at info at ch- uh, forgechurch.com uh, and we will get in touch with you too. You know, next week, next week we start a brand new series called The Space Between Us. So make sure that you join us early because the band are going to be launching the service with an absolute cracker of a song and you won't want to miss it. So make sure you get there early. Hey, have a great rest of the week and uh, I will look forward to seeing you next week. You take care.